All right, we're back with the big story. Our friend Jacob has crossed over and he has got home with his 11 sons, with his daughter, with his two wives, with his maidservants, with all of their servants and maidservants and their children and their staff and all of his camels and sheep and goats and all of their stuff. And he's arrived having been reunited with his brother Esau, who decades ago he manipulated and tricked and stole the blessing and the inheritance and the stuff from and they've been reunited and forgiven and he settled down back home. Home is a strange place. He doesn't remember being there. Maybe he hasn't been there for decades and none of the rest of his family have ever lived there, but it's going to become their home. It's kind of part desert, kind of part farmland. That's where we got to last week. Now remember, he's got one daughter, Dinah, at the moment, and 11 sons at the moment, but only one of those 11 sons was born to his favourite wife, Rachel. And so that son, Joseph, is his favourite one. And so as fathers across the world did back then, he chose to make it obvious to not only to Joseph but to everybody else which one his favourite was by giving Joseph a precious coat. Now this is important because this kind of idea is going to keep on cropping up throughout our story. It's a sign of blessing and of love from a father to give their child the special coat. In fact, right the way at the end of the Bible, one of the writers says that it's like God has clothed us, given us a coat of righteousness and goodness. It's not like God has all given us a new coat, but that's where the idea comes from. The righteousness and goodness of God is on you in the same way that a brand spanking new, colourful, rich, ornate coat was placed by Jacob on the shoulders of Joseph. So Joseph finds himself the wearer of this new coat. And of course, into a family where already the brothers don't trust each other, don't like each other, this added to their jealousy and to their points of disagreement. Now, two responses happen in our story today. The first is the response of the brothers, the other brothers. They begin to get this reputation for destruction, for destroying things, for anger, for jealousy, for resentment. In fact, there's this story you can read of them destroying a whole town to get them back for something they did to their sister. They destroy the whole town. Then another time, this is a really key story, they're all out looking after the sheep and the goats because that's what farmers do, right? When one day they're looking up over the hill and they see in the distance this colourful, bright, shining coat coming towards them. It's Joseph and his spangly new coat. And they've just had enough. They want to destroy him too. So they grab him and they're just about to kill him when Reuben, the oldest brother, steps in for a moment and says, guys, we shouldn't kill him because we want to destroy him. But if we kill him, then that would also destroy our dad and we don't want to do that. So why don't we come up with a better idea? Let's just throw him down a hole. So they throw him down a hole like a well that didn't have any water in and they just leave him there overnight while they think what to do with him. The next morning, they're passed by some traders, people off down to Egypt who are going to take spices and treasures and materials and animals and slaves down to Egypt to try and sell them there. They think, the brothers to themselves, that they could make a quick buck here by destroying Joseph and solving a problem. So they Hink, hoik him out of the hole, they sell him to the slave traders, they rip his coat off him, which they then dip in some animal blood and take back to their dad, Jacob, and say, oh no, Jacob, dad, it looks like an animal got Joseph and killed him. Look at the blood all over his coat, we're so sorry. Meanwhile, though the brothers have destroyed a city and have now destroyed Joseph and their family, Joseph responds in a different way. He decides that wherever he is, he's going to be trustworthy. He's going to act with integrity. He's going to be kind and good and honest. People will be able to trust him all the time. In fact, he gets sold into slavery. He gets bought by a guy named Potiphar, who's a rich guy. And very quickly, Potiphar sees that Joseph can be trusted. And so he promotes him to head of the household. And he knows that Joseph can be trusted with the money and the stuff. This doesn't sound like his father, hey? He can be trusted with things. He's not going to manipulate and steal and run off. In fact, he can also be trusted with his wife. 
But she doesn't like that. In fact, she makes a false accusation about Joseph, which lands him in prison. But even in prison, where he shouldn't really have been, Joseph still acts with integrity, with goodness, with kindness, with trustworthiness. In fact, the guards notice as that he's somebody that they could trust to look after other prisoners. A couple of those prisoners come in and they used to work for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, the most important, powerful man in the world. And they have these dreams and they tell Joseph about these dreams and Joseph is honest with them about what those dreams mean. So much so that when one of them gets back out, having done their time in prison and gets their job back with the Pharaoh, when Pharaoh has a dream, they're able to say to him, hey, Pharaoh, I know this guy who's honest and trustworthy and good and kind. You could trust him to tell you what your dreams mean. So Pharaoh says, get me this man out of prison. So they go and get Joseph out of prison and he goes before Pharaoh and Pharaoh tells him his dreams and Joseph tells him that the dreams mean there's going to be seven years of fantastic crops in Egypt and then there's going to be seven years of famine. So what they need to do is store up all of the crops for seven years so that they can feed everybody during the famine. Pharaoh says, you're the man, you are in charge. You're clearly somebody who I can trust. And he puts another coat on Joseph, this one that makes him look like royalty, this one that makes him look like a king, if you like, this one that makes sure that everybody knows that Pharaoh, his favourite, is Joseph. So what did we learn this week? Number one, if you've got a flashy coat, it might look good, but not everybody is impressed with it. Number two, different responses are possible. It might be true that everybody in your family or in your class or in your workplace or in our culture responds with anger or cynicism or building barriers between people. But that doesn't mean that that's the response that we have to take. Joseph didn't take the same response as his brothers. And we don't have to take the same response as other people. We can choose to be kind and loving and good and trustworthy and to act with integrity in all circumstances. Numero tres. God has promised to bless the whole world through this family. And that seemed like a crazy thing when it was just a small family and now the family's bigger. But it still doesn't feel like that blessing of God could reach the whole world, except now God has managed to get this family down to Egypt and a whole other nation is going to be blessed through the work of Joseph. He's always true to his promise. Number four. There are so many times in this story where it looks like to Joseph that God has abandoned him and this is the worst that it could ever be. He's down at the bottom of a well, he's sold into slavery, he finds himself in prison, but all the time, wherever he is, God is present with him and with you.